as we saw, the Supreme Court in 1972 says the death penalty is unconstitutional in Furman versus Georgia. But the court's decision is a mess. We have five justices in the majority all finding it unconstitutional for different reasons, some of them saying it's unconstitutional because the way it has been used up until the time. And four in the dissent saying it's up to the legislatures, basically. And so what happens after Furman is decided, 1973, Georgia passes a new death penalty statute, signed into law by then Governor Jimmy Carter in March of 1973. And by May of 1973, Georgia's carrying out death penalty trials once again. Uh, the same thing, right promptly after Furman, Texas passes a new uh, death penalty statute. And so do 35 states in just a very short period of time, four years. Uh, a number of states have responded uh, to the Furman decision by passing new death penalty statutes, which they think are designed to deal with the main problem that the court identified in Furman, arbitrariness. So two ways to do this. One, tell the jury how to make its decision, that is, guide the discretion of the jury. Or, secondly, what Justice Berger warned about in his dissenting opinion in Furman, which is make the death penalty mandatory. Take any discretion out of the process uh, and say you commit a certain crime, you, commit a police, you kill a police officer, and the punishment uh, is going to be the death penalty. Uh, so North Carolina, Louisiana passed the mandatory statutes. Their Case come, their cases come before the court in 1976, uh, and uh, the court grants review of the Georgia, Florida, and Texas statutes. And so let's look at what each state did in response to Furman, and then how the court in deciding these five cases, Greg versus Georgia out of Georgia, Profit uh, versus Florida out of uh, Florida, and, and so forth, Jurek versus Texas, uh, Woodson versus North Carolina, uh, and Roberts versus Louisiana, uh, how the court makes a determination of what's constitutional and what's not. Let's first look at what Georgia did. Uh, what every state did uh, was provide for a bifurcated trial. This we had seen in Magatha uh, with California, having one trial on guilt or innocence and another trial on penalty. The idea being you're not uh, compromised in, the, in a unitary trial uh, by having to decide, am I going to defend the case on guilt or innocence, or am I going to put evidence before the jury uh, that supports a sentence less than death? Now there are two different inquiries. First, determine if the person is guilty, then go to a second sentencing phase, which will be focused just on sentencing. Uh, and then aggravating circumstances. Uh, Georgia adopts 10 in its death penalty statute. Uh, one, uh, whether the murder uh, is committed in the course of another felony. This is basically felony murder. Uh, that the court is saying uh, is eligible for the death penalty. Uh, and as you see, rape, armed robbery, kidnapping, aggravated battery, burglary, arson. The question is, are we finding a way to narrow the application of the death penalty? And one of the controversial questions on this is with regard uh, to these felony murder statutes because almost all murders uh, occur in the course of another crime. Uh, the classic being, of course, the holdup of a convenience store uh, in which someone is shot and killed. Uh, those cases are all eligible for the death penalty. Most of them will not be prosecuted as death penalty cases, but they can be. So the question becomes, does this eliminate the arbitrariness that we saw in Furman, or is this enough guidance for the jury uh, that we don't have that arbitrariness? Uh, another factor, the prior record. Uh, of the uh, defendant. Does this person have a prior conviction for a capital felony? If so, that is a reason to give the person uh, the death penalty. Uh, whether the uh, person's actions in committing the crime created a great risk of death to more than one person. Uh, another, whether it was for money or any other thing of monetary value. We've covered here an awful lot of the kinds of crimes uh, that take place uh, when life uh, is lost. Uh, but all of these are, at least, uh, you have objective uh, factors uh, to consider. Is there a robbery? Uh, is there uh, a prior capital felony? Uh, was there a great risk of death? But then the court, or then the state legislature adopts the catch-all aggravating, which really is more descriptive 
uh, than it is anything else. Was the murder outrageously and wantonly vile, horrible, and inhuman? I suppose every murder is outrageously, wantonly, vile, horrible, and inhuman, but the legislature tacks onto that in that it involved torture. We know what torture is. That's a crime. Juries can figure that out. Uh, depravity of mind on the part of the defendant in creating uh, in committing the crime, uh, which is uh, hard to fathom, uh, or, notice any one of these, an aggravated battery uh, to the victim. We'll see some other states adopt uh, catch-all uh, aggravating factors, which are much more vague than the Georgia one. Uh, but here, if a prosecutor finds that a death penalty doesn't fit under any of these others, uh, then it can be uh, perhaps fit under the outrageously, wantonly, vile, horrible, and inhuman aggravating circumstance. Uh, and then uh, the state uh, provides there must be at least one aggravating factor established. No aggravating factor established, that's the end of the process. Uh, the jury uh, returns uh, a verdict of, of life imprisonment. Uh, the jury uh, can consider anything as a mitigating circumstance. We'll see uh, Florida statute, which gives the jury a list of mitigating circumstances, but not Georgia. Georgia says once an aggravating factor has been established, the jury can consider anything else in aggravation, so that's wide open, and then the jury can consider any mitigating factor, and we'll talk more about mitigating factors, but basically mercy evoking reasons for imposing a sentence less than death. Uh, anything about the life and background of the person uh, may be mitigating circumstances of the crime, uh, why it was committed or some aspect of the way it was committed. Uh, perhaps the defendant had a lesser role of uh, being one of several people who committed a crime. Or maybe it's something about uh, the defendant himself uh, that, that is the mitigating factor or factors. Um, but once an aggravating uh, factor is found, uh, in Georgia the jury has complete discretion. Finds one aggravating factor and then it can give death or life. It can give life in prison even if it finds no mitigating uh, factors, uh, but once it has that information before it, uh, complete discretion. Jury must be unanimous. This is not going to be the law in every state, but in Georgia, the jury must be unanimous. Uh, if it can't reach a verdict, then it's a life uh, sentence uh, imposed. Uh, but the jury's recommendation is binding uh, on the judge. Uh, in other words, the jury sentences. This is not, we're going to look at some judge sentencing statutes, uh, but this statute uh, provides for jury sentencing. So in order for the prosecution to get the death penalty, uh, it has to convince all 12 members of the jury that there's at least one statutory aggravating circumstance uh, and that the death penalty is appropriate uh, for the crime, considering both the facts of the crime and the background and circumstances of the person facing the death penalty. Georgia also provides uh, for an automatic appeal uh, to the Georgia Supreme Court, uh, where that court is to decide whether the death penalty is imposed under the influence of passion, prejudice, or any other arbitrary factor, uh, whether the evidence supports the aggravating circumstance, uh, and whether the sentence is excessive or disproportionate. The idea being that the Georgia Supreme Court will look at all the death sentences imposed in the state of Georgia and make a determination of whether uh, there are some that really, compared to other cases, uh, should not be uh, death sentences. Now, the court only looks at this in 1976 as to whether the statute satisfies the Constitution. Uh, in practice, uh, none of these things really happen. Uh, the Georgia Supreme Court just pastes a uh, boilerplate paragraph in its decisions saying that it finds the death penalty was not imposed under the influence of passion, prejudice, or an arbitrary factor that evidence supports the aggravating circumstance, and then it tacks on some other decisions in an appendix uh, where it says the death penalty was imposed in these cases, so it's not disproportionate uh, in this case. So uh, this has been a rather hollow promise, but the Supreme Court is going to say proportionality review is not required uh, anyway. Um, so uh, Florida provides for a bifurcated trial, just like Georgia. Uh, again, a list of aggravating circumstances, not a whole lot different uh, than what we saw. Prior conviction, this we saw in Georgia, of a felony uh, or in prison of parole. Same one we saw in Georgia, great risk of death uh, to many people. Uh, in the commission of another felony, uh, 
Here again, felony murder cases uh, are all going to be eligible for the death penalty. So if it's a murder in the commission of a robbery, a kidnapping, a sexual battery, uh, arson, uh, those cases are going to be uh, eligible for the death penalty. Uh, and then here's the catch-all. Uh, was the murder especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel? Uh, virtually every murder is heinous, atrocious, and cruel. So the question's going to come up, does this really give the jury any principal basis for deciding whether or not to impose the death penalty? Uh, the, court, uh, the statute also provided uh, that if the murder is committed in a cold, calculated, and premeditated manner. Again, these are more descriptive as opposed to uh, definitions uh, of what might uh, make a case aggravated enough uh, for the death penalty to be imposed. But those questions are going to come later. The Supreme Court for now, and of course I have not given you with regard to either Georgia or Florida all of the aggravating circumstances, but I've given you the ones that tend to be used uh, the most often uh, and, and, and apply to the most cases. And of course, more than anything else, is going to be the felony murder. Uh, murder in the commission of a robbery or some other crime. Now, Florida also provides for mitigating circumstances, but unlike Georgia, which just says the jury can consider anything else, once it finds an aggravating factor, it consider anything else uh, in mitigation, uh, Florida actually provides a list uh, for the jury uh, of the mitigating factors. No significant history of prior criminal activity. Uh, extreme emotional distress. Uh, that the person committed the crime, uh, you can imagine, uh, uh, domestic disturbance and uh, the uh, wife has been beaten by her husband and she goes out and shoots him and could argue that there's extreme uh, mental or emotional disturbance. Of course, whether that case is eligible for the death penalty or not, a uh, threshold question, but a prosecutor could say it was heinous, atrocious, and cruel. Uh, the victim was a participant. Almost never is the victim a participant or uh, consented uh, to a murder. Uh, so this one doesn't really apply uh, very much. Uh, relatively minor participation. Uh, as I talked about a moment ago, one of the mitigating factors that may arise in a case, particularly when several people commit a crime together, uh, is whether the, uh, uh, any one of those people was sort of the, you know, the lookout person or was less involved uh, in the crime uh, than some of the others. Uh, extreme duress. Duress is not a defense to murder, but extreme duress, somebody who, for example, is in a gang and put under a lot of pressure to commit a crime uh, as part of an initiation or uh, for whatever reason, that could be a mitigating factor. Now, none of these mitigating factors cancel out the death penalty. They're just factors that the jury must consider in deciding whether or not to impose the death penalty. Uh, uh, and finally, uh, the capacity of the defendant to appreciate uh, or conform uh, his behavior to the requirements uh, of the law. Uh, if a defendant has no ability to conform his behavior to the requirements of the law, that's an insanity defense. Uh, what the legislature in Florida has provided for here is to say a person may not be so uh, lacking in capacity to meet the insanity defense, but they're capacity was impaired, their mental thinking, uh, their mental abilities were, were impaired, and so that's something that we will take into account, uh, sort of like uh, emotional disturbance, uh, that that may be a reason uh, that the jury can consider. Again, these just go into the mix, the aggravating and the mitigating circumstances as to whether or not uh, death is going to be imposed. Uh, in Florida, a jury weighs uh, the aggravating and mitigating factors, the question it asks is, are there sufficient mitigating circumstances uh, which outweigh the aggravating? So unlike Georgia, which has complete wide open discretion once the jury finds an aggravating circumstance, in Florida, the jury weighs, if it's possible, is a question that's worthy of discussion, but we won't take time for that right now, uh, but uh, the jury th theoretically weighs the mitigation against the aggravation and comes out uh, with a sentence. Uh, and then, here's another difference, the jury recommends punishment by a majority vote. No requirement of unanimity, as in Georgia, which says you have to have all 12 jurors agree. In Florida, it can be seven to five. Uh, of course, what one consequence of that 
uh, is the kind of deliberations you have. If you have a requirement of unanimity, it means everybody has equal power. You sit down in that jury room, everybody's got to listen to everybody else, as in the play and movie Twelve Angry Men, uh, until they've thrashed it out and decided what to do. And so that ha there has to be that interaction. Florida, basically the jury, although they're told to deliberate, uh, can go in and take a vote, and if it's seven to five for life or seven to five for death or whatever it may be, uh, they can make their recommendation. But notice this, the judge can override uh, the uh, decision of the jury. Uh, so the jury may come back with life in prison and the judge may give the death penalty, or vice versa, the jury may come back with death uh, and the judge may uh, impose uh, uh, life imprisonment. Uh, in fact, almost all the overrides in Florida and in other states have been life sentences by juries which are overridden to death sentences. Florida ultimately adopted a standard uh, which made it very difficult uh, for judges to override juries. So in Florida, although there were a lot of overrides in the time after 1976 when this case was decided, uh, since that time there have uh, been fewer and fewer overrides and, and virtually none today uh, in Florida. On the other hand, Alabama also has a judge override, uh, really the main state using judge override today. And Alabama, 20% of the people on death row are people who received life sentences from Alabama juries, but they were sentenced to death by judges who overrode uh, the, the jury. And of course, Florida also provides for automatic review by the state Supreme Court. We're going to see this in every state. Whether the defendant asked for it or not, whether they file a notice of appeal or not, the case is going to go, just as in Georgia, the case is going to go to the state Supreme Court and that court is going to decide, uh, uh, review the case and, and make a decision about both the legal errors in the case and, and maybe some questions about the appropriateness of the death penalty. Well, let's go to the great state of Texas, which has a completely different uh, way of defining which cases are going to be death penalty cases. First of all, Texas defines the crime uh, of capital murder as one that's going to be decided at the guilt phase. In other words, there's a crime that if you're convicted of capital murder, then your case goes to the penalty phase. Uh, we see the same sorts of things um, as uh, making one eligible for capital murder, uh, murder of a police uh, or, or a fire person. Uh, here again, felony murder, murder during a kidnapping, burglary, robbery, rape, arson. Any murder in the commission of another crime is going to be eligible for the death penalty. Murder for uh, remuneration uh, is, is as well, murder in the course of an escape, uh, and finally a prisoner who kills a prison employee. Notice what's missing in Texas, no catch-all. No catch-all, heinous, atrocious, and cruel, or, or anything like this. Pretty well defined uh, in terms of what a person uh, has to do in order to be eligible for the death penalty in Texas. The unique part of the Texas statute, that's part of it, but a number of states now have capital murder statutes where at the guilt phase, at the same time the jury's deciding guilt or innocence, it's deciding whether the person is guilty of something plus murder, in other words, an aggravating factor. That's basically Texas moves that determination of aggravating factors into the guilt phase as opposed to having it uh, as Georgia and Florida do in the penalty phase. Uh, so we get to the uh, uh, penalty phase and the jury is asked three uh, questions. Uh, and these are yes-no questions. First, was it deliberate? Uh, did the, uh, was the conduct deliberate with a reasonable expectation that death would occur? The answer to that question is almost always going to be yes, uh, because the person's been found guilty of intentional capital murder at the guilt phase, and most likely uh, it's going to be the, found that it was deliberate. Uh, the only question is the expectation that death would occur. Uh, that may be an issue in some cases. Uh, secondly, and most importantly, is the person a future danger to society? This is uh, introduced by Texas here and upheld in 1976. The jury is asked whether beyond a reasonable doubt there is a substantial probability that the defendant will commit future acts of violence and be a continuing threat to society. This is a highly controversial uh, 
aggravating circumstance. Uh, first of all, what do we mean by substantial probability? Uh, if we say, if the weatherman tells us there's a 30% probability of rain tomorrow, is that a substantial probability? Uh, or do we have to have a 60% probability uh, or, or higher? That's never been decided. Uh, and then the question of, can this even be determined? Can doctors, psychiatrists, or psychologists uh, predict future dangerousness? Uh, and can juries make determinations about it? Uh, well, in Texas they do. Uh, at the time, uh, 1970s, when, when the death point was being posted in Texas, basically uh, in one part of Texas, uh, people would be examined by Dr. James Grigson, uh, who would opine that they were a future danger at the penalty phase of their trials. In another part of Texas, you'd be uh, Dr. Holbrook, uh, would be the doctor who would examine uh, defendants and, and provide an opinion that they were a future danger. Uh, and pretty much at the penalty phase uh, of capital cases uh, in Texas, that would be the, the evidence offered by the prosecution for the death penalty. Because they say, it's not going to be much question about deliberate, uh, and there's not going to be much question about this third uh, issue, provocation. Whether the defendant's conduct was unreasonable in response to provocation. In other words, did the victim do something which caused the defendant to commit the crime? So the, the first and last generally are not going to be issues, so the case is going to come down to future dangerousness. And notice this, once the jury answers those three questions, yes, 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 the death penalty is imposed. The judge has no discretion uh, to reject the death penalty. As Justice Rehnquist says in his dissenting opinion uh, in jerk versus, in, in uh, the mandatory death penalty cases, uh, Woodson versus North Carolina and Roberts versus Louisiana, he says, wait a minute, we've upheld a mandatory death sentence. The, the Texas statute is a mandatory statute. If the jury finds the answers the three questions in the affirmative, the death penalty is imposed. Uh, this scheme here, uh, this statutory approach that Texas took, is the reason that so many people have been executed in Texas. Uh, because uh, if these questions are all answered yes, uh, there's not the discretion that juries have in Florida and Georgia uh, to reject the death penalty and still impose uh, life imprisonment. The jury really uh, is never given that question under this statute. Now we will learn uh, later in the course that ultimately the Supreme Court found some problems with the statute uh, and the fact that it didn't allow uh, certain mitigating circumstances to be considered. But in 1976 the court said, well, in answering some of these other questions, the jury can take into account mitigating circumstances. And so uh, the statutes are going to be uh, upheld uh, based upon that, or the Texas statute was upheld based upon that. Uh, but we'll see, uh, th there were some problems with the statute. Uh, the Supreme Court didn't recognize them for a long time, and by the time it did, an awful lot of people had been sentenced to death and even executed in Texas uh, under this statute, which was upheld in 1976. Um, North Carolina and Louisiana, as I mentioned before, adopt mandatory uh, death penalty statutes. You commit a certain crime, the death penalty is mandatory. Uh, this is to prevent arbitrariness. Uh, so the court has to decide of these five death penalty statutes that it has before them, which, one, which ones are constitutional uh, and which ones are not. Um, and, and in these five cases, uh, we have some justices who find all the statutes constitutional. Chief Justice Berger, Justice White, Blackman, Rehnquist vote to uphold both the Florida, Texas, and um, Georgia statutes uh, and to hold, uphold the mandatory statutes. Now, Justice Brennan and Marshall would say that the death penalty is unconstitutional in all cases, so they would not uphold any of the statutes. And so this leaves the decision making uh, to a plurality of three justices. Justice Stewart, uh, Justice Powell and Justice Stevens, who's now come on the court, taken Justice Douglas's place, appointed by President Gerald Ford, and the three of them write the opinion that joins with uh, Brennan and Marshall to declare the mandatory death penalty unconstitutional by a very close five to four vote, uh, and then join with Chief Justice Berger and the others to uphold uh, the so-called guided discretion statutes, the, the, the statutes that supposedly 
tell the jury how it's to make this decision, the Georgia, Florida, and Texas statutes. So the guided discretion statutes are upheld 7 to 2. The mandatory uh, statutes are uh, declared unconstitutional by a very close vote of 5 to 4. Um, one could ask, uh, why would the mandatory statute uh, be unconstitutional if the goal is to eliminate arbitrariness? And of course, some members of the court felt that mandatory death penalty was perfectly appropriate. Uh, but the court was concerned about, first of all, the risk of arbitrariness. Uh, Justice Stevens, who writes his opinion, talks about uh, jurors often would nullify, would not return a, a verdict of guilty if they felt the death penalty was not appropriate. Uh, but I think what really is a critical take-home lesson of Woodson versus North Carolina, which struck down the North Carolina statute, uh, is uh, the failure to consider the individual circumstances of the offender. This is going to become one of the most important principles in modern death penalty law, that the jury cannot treat the person accused uh, as a faceless mass of criminals. The, that this can't be defined just by the crime. You must take into account uh, the diverse frailties of humankind. Uh, anything about the life and background of the person that militates in favor of a sentence less than death. And this is the basis upon which the mandatory death penalty statutes are struck down. Of course, four justices would have upheld them and said, you know, th these are, th the states can decide uh, what the uh, jury can consider, and if the state wants to make it mandatory based on the crime, uh, there's no requirement of individualized sentencing. But the majority of the court, uh, the plurality that I described, uh, and Brennan and Marshall uh, come together to hold uh, that there must be consideration of individual circumstances uh, in order uh, to impose the death penalty. Um, well, what do we get out of these opinions? Let's look at the critical opinions, which is Justice Stewart, Powell, and Stevens. Uh, and look at how the court dealt with some of these issues that we had in 1972 in Furman versus Georgia. First of all, the evolving standards of decency. Uh, 35 state legislatures uh, have now adopted the death penalty and many juries have imposed it and this group says, and, and the others uh, who joined them, Chief Justice Berger and that group, uh, it's clear that the death penalty does not violate the evolving standards of decency because 35 legislatures wouldn't have adopted it if it did. So it tells us that society accepts the death penalty. Dignity. Uh, dignity, uh, these justices say, relates to the consideration of individual circumstances. Brennan and Marshall would say dignity means the death penalty is unconstitutional. But the majority, uh, or at least the plurality here, holds that dignity says You've got to look into the individual circumstances of the person who's facing the death penalty. Uh, they also talk about uh, that it cannot be so without justification that it results in the gratuitous uh, infliction uh, of, of, uh, uh, of suffering. Uh, and then they uphold it based on the purposes. Retribution, remember Justice Marshall, had said previously that retribution was not even a valid consideration. We see in the 1976 cases that most of the members of the court accept retribution, uh, sentencing somebody uh, to uh, punish them for what they did uh, is a fair uh, reason to have uh, the death penalty. And if a state legislature decides it wants it for that purpose, it can have it. Deterrence is a tricky question uh, because the studies on deterrence are all are, are mixed. I mean, some uh, find that uh, the death penalty deters and others, most, find that it does not. Uh, before, uh, in 1972, uh, Justice Brennan and some of the other members of the court had said, well, unless the states can show that it deters, uh, they can't have the death penalty. In other words, they put the burden of proof on the states. Well, now the court changes that, uh, at least the plurality of justices does, and says uh, it's up to the legislature to decide. Uh, whether it deters. And if a state legislature decides that it wants to adopt the death penalty because it believes it deters, uh, that's up to the legislature. And the challengers, the people challenging the death penalty, would have to show that it does not deter, uh, which, again, if the studies are all in conflict, that's going to be and has been pretty impossible to prove. Um, Brennan and Marshall, different notion of dignity the intrinsic worth of people 
uh, as human beings. Uh, that uh, Brennan says that punishment must not be degrading, as we talked about before. Marshall must not be the total denial of the wrongdoer's dignity and worth. Uh, this turns out to be a minority view uh, because the majority says we look at dignity only to look at the individual circumstances of the people. We don't think that extinguishing human life uh, is uh, a affront to dignity in a way that violates the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution in the way that Justice, uh, Chief Justice Warren had described in Troop versus Dulles. Um, retribution. Uh, here Justice Stewart repeats some of what he had said in Gregg, uh, when people believe that the organized society is not going to impose uh, punishment on criminals uh, that they deserve, uh, then he says, then you sow the seeds of uh, vigilante justice, lynch mob, uh, uh, self-help, and so forth. Uh, and so he basically is saying we have to channel this uh, passion, this reaction, this uh, thirst for vengeance uh, that comes out of a terrible crime uh, by allowing it to be done in the courts as opposed to uh, having people resort to vigilante justice or, or lynch law. It shows how close we are in time to the time of lynch law uh, and vigilante justice, of the race riots and the lynchings that had gone on uh, earlier uh, in the century uh, and are not lingering that far behind. Of course, one can argue uh, that Basically, the government ought to be able to deal with uh, the, the vigilante justice and lynch law. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to have the death penalty to do that. And of course, a number of states uh, still, 15, did not have the death penalty at this time. The other thing the court says with regard to retribution, certain crimes themselves are so grievous uh, that they, uh, such an affront to humanity, the only adequate punishment is going to be the sentence of death. Uh, and so. Uh, the court finds that for uh, murder, at least, which all these cases involved murders, uh, the five cases. We're going to see later the court looking at some non-murder cases to decide whether it's appropriate to impose the death penalty. But with these cases, the court says some crimes so grievous an affront uh, to society uh, that they can be punished uh, by uh, the death penalty. Um, deterrence. Just to come back to what I, I said earlier, the studies have been uh, inconclusive. Uh, the plurality says uh, probably there are some people for whom uh, deterrence works and there are probably other people uh, who are not deterred. Uh, but we're not going to get into that. It's a complex issue. Uh, it's not for the court to sort out. As I said earlier, it's for the legislature. And so we're going to let the legislatures, the state legislatures and Congress, uh, have hearings hear the pros and cons of deterrence and whether the death penalty deters and make their own decision whether to adopt the death penalty. So it pretty much takes deterrence off the table. Uh, in the uh, Furman decision, the court was talking a lot, members of the court were talking a lot about, is this serving the purpose of deterrence? And some justices were saying it's so infrequently used and, and uh, it's so arbitrary that it doesn't deter. But now the court is basically saying, we're going to leave deterrence to the legislatures. Uh, it's not for us to decide. Uh, and so uh, retribution is an acceptable reason to have the death penalty. Deterrence is something we're leaving up to the legislature. So what's the answer? What's the, uh, what do we come out of the 1976 cases with? Bifurcated trials. Every state uh, that has the death penalty uh, has bifurcated trials. One trial on guilt or innocence and another on penalty. Narrow the class of eligibles. Uh, narrow who can be sentenced to death? That is, provide what Justice White was looking for in 1972, that principal reason why some people get the death penalty and, and others do not. And we saw that Georgia did that by uh, providing once the jury finds an aggravating circumstance, it has complete, complete discretion. Uh, Florida uh, weighs whether there are sufficient mitigating circumstances that outweigh the aggravating circumstances. And finally, Texas gives the jury three questions and it answers those questions, and as I said earlier, if the question is answered yes, then it means the death penalty is imposed. If it's answered no to any of the questions, then the death penalty is not imposed. Um, three, discretion of the jury must be suitably directed and limited to, to minimize the risk of arbitrary and capricious sentencing. In other words, we've got to tell the jury how it's to go about its job in a way that 
uh, takes into account the circumstances of the crime, but also the circumstances of the individual offender. And the jury must be given guidance with, these are jury instructions we're talking about here, clear and objective standards about the fact of the crime and about the defendant. And so uh, those are uh, critical. Now, in addition to that, uh, we saw that uh, automatic appeal was provided for by Georgia, it had been provided in Florida. Uh, it's unclear whether it's constitutionally required. This, the court sort of uh, talks about it with approval in these cases, uh, but it's never held that automatic appeal is required. And by automatic, I mean even if the defendant doesn't file a notice of appeal, which is required in other cases to appeal, uh, the, the case, if a death sentence is imposed, that case is going to be reviewed by a higher court. Uh, and every state that has the death penalty and the federal government uh, provide for that. Uh, at the time these cases were decided, in 1976, uh, the thought was that proportionality review, like Georgia has, uh, that is comparing the case in which the defendant was sentenced to death with other cases involving similar facts uh, to decide whether the death penalty was disproportionate. That is, is it excessive? Were there other people who got convicted of very similar crimes or maybe more heinous crimes who did not receive the death penalty. Uh, that was uh, seen by some at that time as constitutionally required, but as we'll see, the court later holds that it's not uh, constitutionally required. And so most states abandon their proportionality review uh, once the Supreme Court decides that. Um, Justice Powell says, to sort of sum this up, uh, guidance is sufficient if the factors channel the discretion of the jury by requiring them to examine the factors that argue in favor and against the death penalty. In other words, the aggravating factors, reasons to give the death penalty, the mitigating factors, reasons not to give the death penalty. And the judge is to instruct the jury, you've got to find one or more of these aggravating factors, that is in the states that Florida and Georgia, uh, and then describes how to consider mitigation uh, and theoretically that will uh, put before the jury, this is what the court said couldn't be done in Magatha. Magatha said just a year earlier, it's beyond human ability to define before the fact what are the characteristics of the crime and the offender that justify the death penalty. One year later, under the Eighth Amendment, the Supreme Court does exactly that. Uh, excuse me, uh, four years later, the Supreme Court does exactly that. Uh, two other points which we'll leave with, uh, with regard to Gregg versus Georgia and uh, all the cases, but this was mentioned in Gregg. First of all, where a life is at stake, uh, the courts must be particularly sensitive to see that every safeguard is observed. Uh, the idea, at least in 1976, was that if the death penalty is imposed, then uh, because death is different, because of the stakes involved, because of the irrevocability of the death penalty, we are going to make sure that every safeguard is observed. Uh, that uh, will be abandoned uh, as the years go by. Uh, but that was at least the notion in 1976. And then secondly, uh, that accurate sentencing information is indispensable. In other words, the jury has to have not just the facts of the crime, they're going to have that, because the law enforcement is going to investigate the crime, they're going to present all the details uh, that are available with regard to how the crime was committed, but they also have to have the information about the offender, the circumstances uh, of the offender. And this is going to put a great deal of responsibility on defense counsel, as we will talk about uh, later in the course. Uh, the responsibility of defense counsel to conduct the investigation into the life and background uh, of uh, the defendant uh, and uh, put that evidence before the jury so that it can give consideration not only to the circumstances of the crime, but the life and background of the defendant and any factors that are mitigating factors that militate in favor of a sentence less than death. So once the dust clears, uh, with these five decisions coming out, we know that guided discretion statutes are constitutional. Uh, Georgia, Florida, and Texas are going to be allowed to go ahead. Other states are going to adopt uh, statutes like theirs. Probably the model is Florida, the weighing statute. That's what the federal government has, and a number of other states ha have adopted weighing statutes. But there are also states uh, that adopted future dangerousness determinations, uh, 
uh, and, and other elements of these uh, three cases. Uh, but basically this let the states know this is what you can do uh, that's constitutional. And you cannot have a mandatory death penalty. The court considered a number of cases later on involving mandatory death penalty in certain circumstances where the argument was made, well, if you kill a person in prison after you've been sentenced to life in prison, you could have a mandatory death penalty. No, not so. Basically, the court has rejected every uh, effort to justify a mandatory death penalty. So juries have to have some discretion uh, in whether or not to impose the death penalty. They have to be instructed as to what factors militate in favor of the death penalty, what factors militate uh, against the death penalty. And what we'll take up next uh, is the death penalty for certain crimes, uh, whether the death penalty can be imposed for uh, the role of the offender in the crime, for particular crimes where there's not a murder involved, uh, and then for particular people, uh, for children, uh, for intellectually disabled people, and other people. Are there some people that under the cruel and unusual clause, the death penalty should really be off limits? And that's what we'll take up in our next session. Thank you.